Okay. Um, so, any specific questions about Chapter 3? Thank you. Or do you just want to run through the, the study guide? Or any questions from lecture? I yes. Have, so, I have, like, the ratio of, like, tertiary, secondary, primary. Okay. Of, like, energy to break. Yep. And then... I'm kind of confused with that and then the radical stability part. Sure. I feel like they don't like... Correlate? Yeah. Okay, yeah, so let's talk about that. Um, so on Dr. Crosper's notes, if you want to turn to page two, because that's kind of where this is talked about. So um, under propagation... Hi there. We just barely started. Um, if you just want to sign in when you get a chance, and you were here last week, right? Yeah. If you could just make a note that you were here last week. Um, so we had a question about kind of um, relating the reactivity of an alkane um, with the stability of its um, radical. Okay, so if you look at the picture on Dr. Cosper's notes, you see different amount, different amounts of energy. Okay, so this is primary, secondary, and then tertiary. So primary requires a lot of energy to make, or um, to break that bond, excuse me. So we're talking about the carbon-hydrogen bond on a primary carbon, okay? So it takes more energy to pull this hydrogen off of this carbon than it would to pull it off of this carbon, for example, okay? And then tertiary, even less. Okay, so we're just talking about bond association energy. Now, that relates to the radical in that a primary radical is the most unstable, okay? So it takes the most energy to make, and it's the most unstable. So the way I like to think of it, um, would you rather run three miles or one mile? One mile, right? Because it's less energy to do it, right? It's less of an inconvenience to do it. So the more energy you have to put into something, the more unstable whatever it is you're making. Um, because basically you're forcing it into a state that it doesn't want to be in. So the less energy it takes to form the radical, the more stable that radical will be. Um, so a primary carbon radical is the least stable, takes the most energy to form. A tertiary carbon radical takes the least energy to form and is the most stable. That's a good question. Any other questions about chapter three before we get started? Like just running through everything? Can I just of course. So the stability is talking about the radical. Yes. And the bond, the energy bond is talking about the carbon hydrogen. Right, the alkane before it gets made. Uh, that's okay. What the yeah, yeah. Um, and if you look at the notes, I know it might be hard for those that are watching on YouTube. Um, so you see the alkane reacting here with the chlorine radical. Okay, so this section of notes is corresponding to that alkane there on that, that reactant part of the um, part of the equation. Over here, we have the actual carbon radical, okay, in propagation step two. So this information here is applying to the actual radical once it's been formed. Does that make sense? Okay. Does that make sense to everybody? Okay. So I'll just head back to the beginning of chapter three if nobody else has any specific questions. Can I go ahead and erase this? I see you writing back there. So the first concept you really need to be comfortable with is the difference between homolytic cleavage and heterolytic cleavage. So I like to start with heterolytic because that's the kind of cleavage that you're already really comfortable with whether you know it or not. Okay, so in Dr. Cosper's note she gives a really good example. Okay, so here we have A and B in a molecule. When this bond breaks, 
the electrons go over to B. Anytime you see those arrows, that's just showing where the electrons are moving. When this bond cleaves, B has taken both electrons from that bond. So it has a negative charge. A has lost an electron, giving it a positive charge. What's the name of a positive ion? Cation. And a negative ion? Anion. Good. So heterolytic cleavage, hetero meaning different. Um, so when the bond breaks in heterolytic cleavage, electrons go to one atom, both electrons, resulting in cations and anions. So two different products being made. Homolytic cleavage, homo meaning same, means the two products are the same. So um, in this type of cleavage, instead of the electrons both going to one atom, one electron goes to one, one electron goes to another. So that's why you can see in her notes you have two arrows. So both of these products have one lone electron. What's the term for something that has one lone electron? Starts with an R. Radical. So we have two radicals here. So homolytic cleavage, they both get one electron, they both get the same. Heterolytic, there's difference. So we have negative and positive ions being made. Does this concept make sense to everybody? I'm going to go ahead and erase this then. Uh, is it? Can I erase? Okay. 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 So the next piece, bond association energies. So I kind of talked to this a little bit um, when we were talking about um, alkanes forming um, carbon radicals. This piece specifically is talking about the bond association energies of haloalkanes. Okay, so we can see, um, I'll just draw it for everybody. Okay, so we have carbon bonded to each of the halogens, okay? Um, so bond association is again just the bonds breaking. So bond associate, dissociation energy is the amount of energy it takes to break these bonds, okay? So when we are talking about this, there's really two um, characteristics that come into play, and you might remember this from when we were talking about acids. So size and electronegativity. So all of these are halogens, so they're fairly electronegative, but who remembers which halogen is the most electronegative? Fluorine. It was, it was one of the ends ones, right? Yeah. So fluorine is the most electronegative. This is really important, just in general in any chemistry course. So again, just as a reminder, electronegativity is the strength that um, an atom has to pull an electron away from somebody else. Okay, so the more electronegative, that means um, the more reactive, right? So fluorine is looking to take an electron from anything, okay? Um, so when we're talking about actually breaking bonds, if something's very electronegative, it's going to want to hold on to whatever it's in a bond with, which makes it very difficult to break that bond. So even though this is the most electronegative, all of these are fairly electronegative, okay? So keep that in mind. The biggest difference between these four is actually size, okay? So which one of these is the largest? Iodine. Iodine. Good. Um, for those of you that were here last week, we talked about how um, if you look at the periodic table, each row is like adding another energy level. So iodine is five rows down. So iodine actually has five energy levels, making it a very, very big atom. Okay? So it, um, if you don't remember that from regular chemistry. Um, and I think I actually use an example. Let me... No, it's not perfect. Sorry, guys, for my messiness. Um, 
So this is hydrogen and fluorine. This is hydrogen and iodine. This is not to scale. Iodine is actually much, much bigger than this because each of these energy levels. Um, so when we're talking about size, we're really talking about distance. So the distance from um, the nucleus of iodine to the nucleus of the hydrogen or whatever it's um, in a bond with. So the greater the distance, the harder it is, or let me, the greater the distance, the easier it is to break that bond. Okay, so fluorine, not only is it extremely electronegative, it's also very small. So it takes a lot of energy to actually separate and break this bond or break this bond. With iodine, even though it's still very electronegative, it's so much larger, it's going to take a lot less energy to break this bond. So if you look at Dr. Cosper's notes, here it takes 110, um, like in terms of energy, I'm, I'm assuming that's either, I'm assuming that's joules or kilojoules. Um, so 110, then it drops down to 85, 70, 57. Okay, so essentially it takes a lot more energy to break this bond than it does to break this bond. Okay, does that concept make sense to everybody? Any questions on bond association energies? Can I erase this? Okay. Okay. Um, the next piece, I'm pretty sure Dr. Fred has a conversation about um, oil and gas in World War One or World War Two. Okay, um, that can sometimes be a little confusing, right? What do you need to know from that? Um, really, it's the definition of the two terms that Dr. Cosper lists here. So the first one is pyrolysis. Okay, so if we had no context to this uh, word, let's see if we can break it up, okay? Um, pyro, what do people think of when they think of pyro? Fire? Heat, yes. So in this reaction, we're heating up alkanes, okay? Um, very, very high temperatures. What about lysis or lice? Break down, excellent. So in pyrolysis, we're actually heating up the alkanes and we're breaking carbon-carbon bonds, carbon-hydrogen bonds. And the reason that I make that distinction is cracking, you only break carbon-carbon bonds, but we're going to go into that a little bit. So essentially in pyrolysis, all the bonds are up for grabs um, to break. And so this leads to a lot of variety in the types of products that are made. Okay, um, And so that's really the biggest difference between pyrolysis and cracking. So let's talk a little bit about cracking, and then we'll kind of relate it back to pyrolysis. Um, so cracking. Essentially, we're taking a really big alkane or lots of big alkanes and we're breaking it up into smaller alkanes. So we're only breaking carbon-carbon bonds. So at the very end of this, our products are going to be a variety of alkanes, but only alkanes. Again, in pyrolysis, we're not just breaking carbon-carbon, we're breaking carbon-hydrogen. So we could end up with alkenes, alkanes, I'm sure a variety of other, essentially anything's up for grabs, okay? Um, so cracking, you're just making smaller alkanes. Does that make sense? You said it only, okay, so cracking only makes alkanes and yep. the other one, pyrolysis? Yes. You can make anything? And anything is kind of, but like just a variety. Okay. Okay. I don't know exactly all the, the limits of what can be made there, but you've got a lot of other stuff going on basically. So yes. Any questions on pyrolysis or cracking? Can I erase this, or do, are people still writing? Okay. Um, 
The next section is really the meat and potatoes of this chapter. So if you're going to understand anything, I'd want you to understand the radical chain reaction and feel really confident with that. Blink there. Okay, so radical chain reaction. Our end product, and something to keep in mind here, we're trying to make haloalkanes. Okay, this is the purpose. Sometimes students remember all the details of the reaction and then they don't understand why they're even doing this. So the overall purpose of this reaction is to make haloalkanes. There are three steps. So chain reaction, okay, so this is going to happen again and again and again and again. It's not a reaction that um, you start and you stop. There's going to be multiple rounds of this reaction happening in a, in a system, okay? Um, does anybody remember the first step? Initiation. Does that sound familiar? Um, so in Dr. Cosper's notes, I did bring some a variety of colors because I like to add colors to her. Um, especially in this one. Um, so, let's see. Dr. Cosper uses chlorine as the halogen for this. Um, we're going to talk more about um, how other halogens would react in, in this scenario, um, but that's kind of why we're using chlorine, just for that context. So imagine you have a, a box, okay? And in that box, you have a bunch of chlorine gas floating around. So Cl2, okay? The beginning of this reaction, the initiation of this reaction, is when homolytic cleavage happens and you end up with two chlorine radicals. And I'm going to put them in boxes like Dr. Koster did because I find that helpful to keep track of them as they move throughout this. So this one is a circle. So, radical, radical. Okay? First step. So again, in terms of like, what is he going to ask me about this? Um, you need to know the term initiation. You need to know if he's um, describing it and you need to be able to fill in the blank. Um, but you also should know the kind of generally what's going on in that reaction. He could say what is created in the initiation reaction and radical chain reaction. So chlorine free radicals. Okay. Um, so you kind of need to know the name and generally what's happening in that reaction. Any questions about initiation? Usually pretty simple, right? Okay. So one of these chlorine radicals is going to move on to the next step. This other one is going to float into space. It's going to be in that box. So this is just floating around in the box. Okay, it's not being used right now. So we have propagation and we have propagation one and propagation two. So propagation step one. So we have our chlorine radical from initiation. And it's going to react with an alkane. In this example, they use methane, but any alkane could work here, and we'll talk about that later. So in this reaction, we're again going to have homolytic cleavage. Okay, um, she just draws the product. I'm just going to take it one step further just so you can kind of see it. Um, okay, so hydrogen free radical, carbon free radical. So that is made from this homolytic cleavage. Can you see that all the way in the back? Okay. So this chlorine is actually going to bond with this hydrogen. Ooh, did that wrong. Ooh, why do I keep putting Okay. And we're left with our carbon free radical. I see some confused faces. Any questions on this? So did you replace um, with the circular, the 
electron is it just as one now like why did you see Oh, this, the cloud. Yeah, yeah. Oh, okay. Um, so that's just showing where the electron is. Um, if you look at Dr. Koster's, you'll kind of see that's where I got this graphic from. Um, so it's, it's just from the, um, so carbon is going to have hybridized sp orbitals, which look like this is where the electron is housed in that case. Um, he's not going to make you draw it, so don't feel like you have, it, it, you should be comfortable with the way it looks. Okay. But other than that, you won't really have to use that. Okay, can I move on to propagation two? Okay, I should have enough space. I'll make enough space. Okay, so this chlorine, this is the end of the road for this chlorine, okay? In the next step, we're actually gonna have two different CL molecules. Do I keep doing that? Okay, so remember, we're in a box with a bunch of chlorine gas floating around. So there's lots of chlorine Cl2 molecules floating around. This is just one of millions in a sense, okay? So we broke up one here, we have a new one here. The only thing coming from propagation one is this methyl radical. We're leaving everything else behind. Okay, and as you can see in Dr. Cosper's notes, we're having homolytic cleavage of this chlorine molecule again. Okay, so we're going to end up with Two radicals. Okay. This is getting slightly messy, so I apologize. The green one is going to react with this methyl radical. So we have our haloalkane, which was our purpose from the beginning, and another chlorine radical, which is going to float around in space in the box. Okay? So again, this is the main purpose. This is why we did this, haloalkane. So if you're talking about propagation two, chlorine, another chlorine molecule um, cleaves into two chlorine radicals, one of which reacts with our methyl radical, creating our haloalkane. Okay, not saying that he will make you write it out in a sentence, but that's kind of generally, generally what's happening in this part of the reaction. Any questions about propagation two? Have I lost anybody? Okay, so the last step, I'm going to go up here. I know that's confusing, so I apologize. So remember our two chlorine radicals that flew around in space. So eventually, they can meet and actually create another Cl2 molecule. Okay, this can go back to the beginning to initiation. Okay, so these chlorine radicals can float around, they can combine into a Cl2 molecule again, they can break up again into radicals and then be used in the equation. So essentially, initiation prop and propagation are going to continue. This whole reaction is going to continue until there's no more chlorine gas left. Or there's no more chlorine radicals, actually, I should say that. Yes? Why does initiation need to keep happening? Why can't the two or three radicals up there just go right into... Like propagation one. So these ones? Yeah. 
Right. So essentially it's, because it, remember, all of this is just happening, right? Everything's just floating around. So if these two chlorine radicals um, collide, they can make this. If this chlorine radical is floating around and it runs into a me uh, methane, it could react with that. So it's not saying that it would always go from radical back to Cl2 back to radical. This is just an example. That's a good question. It's basically whatever it runs into until there's no more chlorine radicals and then the reaction stops. Did I mention that this was termination? I apologize. Last step is termination. So I went through a lot. How's everybody feeling about this? That good? Uh, any questions on any of these steps? Because if not, I'm going to talk. Um, actually, we already kind of talked about the reactivity um, and stability. So we've essentially covered all of the information on page two. Yes. Um, so in the very first step, what is? Yeah. Initiation or propagation one? Uh, initiation. Okay. Yep. Uh, actually, no, I lied. Propagation. <laughs> propagation. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> so what exactly is chlorine and the CH? Yeah. Yep. So what exactly? What, what's is happening there? Is it called? Yeah. Um. So okay. Yep. So we're gonna have another round of homolytic cleavage that's going to create these two radicals, okay? okay? This radical, the H hydrogen radical, reacts with the chlorine radical. Oh. And then what's left over is this methyl radical. <laughs> yes, colors, colors help with this section. Um, definitely be ready for some multiple choice questions about... Um, the amount of energy and stability of certain ones. So he could say, um, you know, which of the carbon radicals are um, most stable? Primary, secondary, tertiary, quaternary. He could throw in some other ones that aren't real, right? So don't fall for those red herrings. I'm sure you've seen them already. Um, and, you know, which, um, which alkane requires the, the most energy to make a radical? So primary, secondary, tertiary. So the questions are probably going to look very similar, so just make sure that you're paying attention and really understanding what he's asking you. Any more questions on this? What kind of questions will we ask about this? Like um, so kind of like I said before, so definitely um, be able to identify, um, probably you're going to see a lot of, well you guys kind of know the structure of his questions. You have some interesting multiple choice questions, some fill in the blanks. Mm -hmm. So chances are for these, it's going to be fill in the blank or very short definitions. So he could explain initiation and say, what step does this um, define? So you would have to know which of these steps he's talking about. Um, he could also potentially say, although this is probably more for an exam, like your midterm, um, what are the products of initiation? Or what are the products of propagation one? Um, Those are probably the kinds of questions you should expect. He wants you to know the name of the step and kind of generally what's happening. Any other questions? Okay. So the last page. Um, so I kind of said, I kind of led into this, but um, we use chlorine for this example. Technically, you could almost use any halogen for this, but there are some things to consider. Um, so let's talk about why chlorine was used for this example. It has to do with selectivity and reactivity. So we have our halogens. Okay, so let's start with fluorine because we already kind of talked about fluorine. So is fluorine, so fluorine's the most electronegative, so that means it's very reactive, right? 
So as you get closer to fluorine, you become more and more reactive. So as we go up, we increase in reactivity. Okay? Selectivity is the opposite. So as we go down towards iodine, we get more selective. I like to use the example of um, like a high school dance. So if all these halogens are at the high school dance, fluorine is the kid who will dance with anybody, doesn't really care, just wants to get up and dance, has a grand old time with pretty much anybody. So very reactive, but doesn't really select for anybody, right? I mean, he could have a paper bag over his head and he would be happy dancing with whoever he is. Um, so selectivity is the opposite. So that's the, the person standing in the corner, you know, refuses to dance with anybody, won't even step onto the dance floor. So that's iodine. Iodine doesn't even react in the radical chain reaction. So it's so selective that it doesn't even react. Um, this can be kind of tricky because uh, a popular question for him is which one of these is the most selective? And it's technically bromine because iodine doesn't even react. So iodine is so selective that it kind of opts out of the, of the dance. So bromine is the next best choice for that. So don't get kind of caught off guard if he asks you that question. Does this concept make sense? Any questions about selectivity or reactivity? Okay. Um, there's also a section that basically describes, you know, if you're a, a science, um, you, a scientist doing this, um, which one would you choose? So obviously we wouldn't choose fluorine because it doesn't react at all. Um, otherwise known, it's endothermic, right? For those of you that were here last week, um, if it's endothermic, that's an unfavorable state. So iodine isn't a good choice. Fluorine is so reactive that you don't really know what products are going to be made. So that's not a good choice. Um, in reality, bromine is the kind of gold standard, if you will, um, but it's really expensive. So a lot of times, chlorine is what's used, even though it's slightly more reactive and not necessarily as selective as you would want. Um, it's a cheaper option. Um, so that's kind of the real world application of what we just talked about. Any questions on that? Feeling okay? What are CFCs? Freons, good, that's one name for them. What's the long, annoying name for them? Chlorofluorocarbons. Why are you learning about them? What's the purpose? What did they do? Why are they banned nowadays? Nothing? Ozone. Ozone. So these are the, some of the reason, well, this is the, these are the chemicals that destroyed the ozone layer. Okay, and they did that through a radical chain reaction. Um, so if you look at Dr. Cosper's notes, okay, this is the initiation of that reaction. So this is a chlorofluorocarbon, and we have homolytic cleavage here, creating a chlorine radical. This chlorine radical reacts with ozone. You should know that ozone is O3. That's just, that's just good. good to know. The chlorine radical breaks up ozone and leaves O2, which is great, but it's not protective. So this piece is really important. This is kind of propagation. This is what we talked about here. So we see the chlorine actually breaking up the ozone. In the second step, the CLO, 
actually reacts with oxygen and remakes that chlorine radical. So essentially, this step goes and we free up that chlorine radical again, and that chlorine radical is just going to go and destroy another piece of ozone. So a very small amount of CFCs destroy a large amount of ozone, which is why they're now very illegal, and that's why we um, are very careful with them. So are you going to have to know this reaction? Of course not. But he is definitely going to want you to know at least one of these words. He's going to maybe ask about their significance, right? They destroyed the ozone layer. That's really all you need to write. Um, but it's just about kind of understanding why these were not good for these. Okay? Does that make sense? Okay. Well, did you say something was good to know with chlorine when you made that arrow? Um, uh, it was actually for ozone. So oh. knowing that, um, so he might not write out ozone. He could write out O3. You should know that O3 stands for ozone. Okay, that's the molecular formula. Okay. Any other questions? I'm going to move on to Hammond's postulate. Um, so this has to do with the transition state and the um, thermodynamics of a, of a reaction, okay? So just as a refresher, for those of you that were here last week, we did touch on kinetics and we looked at curves like this. Um, so we know that this peak here is what? What is this representing? Energy of activation. Energy of activation, excellent. Oh, um, or activation energy. Um, so this is the amount of energy needed for the reaction to take place. Um, what we didn't really talk about, or I don't think we talked about, at this point here, you're actually forming your transition state. A transition state is, the name kind of says it for itself, so it's the middle point between reactants and products. So oftentimes, um, I don't want to get too specific, I'll use an example that you'll you'll see in chapter six and seven, just to kind of show you what I mean. So NU just stands for nucleophile. You'll see this in chapter six. Um, and here we have a halo alkane. Anytime you see an X attached to a carbon, the X stands for a halogen. Okay. Um, so here we have a nucleophile reacting with this halo alkane. And we can tell from the products that the nucleophile is kind of taking the, the halogen spot. Okay. We've released the halogen. Now the nucleophile is attached to that carbon. So the transition state actually looks like this. I'm going to put dotted lines because these are kind of temporary. So in the transition state, you actually have the nucleophile and the halogen both bonded at the same time. This only is there for a few seconds, probably less than that. Um, and then the halogen is removed. So the transition state is just the, the stepping stone from products, uh, reactants, to products. Okay. Everybody okay with the transition state? I, I got a question about it earlier today, so that's why I just wanted to um, kind of run through that. Um, so I'm just going to erase this. So when we're talking about transition state, you can either have a transition state that forms very fast, very early in the reaction. Or you have one that forms late. Okay? If something, if the transition state is formed early, you're going to have a fast exothermic reaction. What does it mean, exothermic? What does that term mean? 
releases energy. Very good. So exo, exits, thermic, you can think of energy, heat, however you want to imagine that. So you can imagine if we have a late transition state, the opposite is going to be true. So we're going to have a very slow reaction that's endothermic. In Dr. Cosper's notes, she actually uses um, the example of um, fluorine being used in the radical chain reaction. So we'd have a very fast exothermic reaction there. And this would kind of be iodine, right? Iodine is endothermic. We'd actually have to put energy into it for it to take place. Um, so just another context if you're looking at Dr. Cosper's notes. So definitely know Hammond's postulate and know that it's talking about these two topics. So he could say, um, in this reaction, the transition state is formed early on. Does this mean that the reaction is exothermic, endothermic, fast, quick, slow, select all that apply, right? Um, so it could also be um, a fill in the blank, although I think that would probably be more for an exam, but he could explain this theorem and say, this is blank's postulate. So you would have to know Hammond's postulate. Does this make sense? Everybody feel okay with this? Okay. So the last piece is talking about combustion. Um, and the heat of, or the energy of combustion. You don't need to know this um, reaction necessarily, but it is helpful to at least remember the products of combustion, um, which you should remember from regular chemistry. Um, so again, it's just CO2 and water. And obviously heat is released, right? It's combustion. Um, so definitely keep those in mind. That's up for grabs. He talks to you about the energy of combustion um, and what affects it. Um, in this reaction, you should know that the fuel is oxidized. Okay? So we're adding oxygen to this. Essentially, we're breaking the carbon-carbon bonds, the carbon-hydrogen bonds. Every carbon in this alkane gets made into a CO2 molecule. So it's fully oxidized. And there's really just two points to keep in mind. Um, the bigger alkane you have, the more energy you get from combustion. That makes sense, right? Because there's more carbons to oxidize. The other piece, um, if you're looking at isomeric alkanes, so isomers, in other words. Um, so imagine the hydrogens here. So these are two isomers of each other, right? They have the same number of carbons and they would have the same number of hydrogens. If we were to combust these two molecules, we would get different energy of combustions. And that has to do with, really, if you think about it, um, we have um, different classifications of carbons, right? We have a primary carbon, secondary, secondary, primary, 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 tertiary. So that right there is going to affect how much energy is released when you are breaking these bonds. So that's just the last piece there, knowing that isomers are going to have different heats of com uh, energies of combustion. That's pretty much chapter three. Any questions on chapter three? Yes. Anything else? Can start talking about chapter four. And we only have 15 minutes. So chapter four has to do with cycloalkanes. Alkanes, we're still dealing with carbon-carbon single bonds, um, but we have some sort of um, circular geometric shape happening. Um, so the first thing to understand is the skeletal structure. When you're dealing with 
cycloalkanes, um, unless he specifically says it, you can put everything in skeletal structure. It makes it a lot easier. You don't have to write all of the carbons and hydrogens. I'm not even going to do heptane because I don't know how to draw heptane. Seven sides. You know how to imagine it. Um, so first thing to really be comfortable with is naming and identifying them. Um, they're really easy to name. Did he go over that in lecture? Okay. So you name the straight chain alkane and you just add cyclo in front of it. So three carbons, prop, all single bonds, ane, cyclic, cyclopropane. Okay, um, and if we have time and if people want to, we could do some more advanced naming because those are technically up for grabs. Um, but I think everybody can kind of grasp the, the general naming. Um, the big thing that you're talking about in this chapter is ring strain. Okay, um, and ring strain, there's three different types, but the easiest one to kind of identify is ring size. Okay, the smaller the ring or the smaller the bond angle, the greater the ring strain. So I'm going to say that again. The smaller the ring, or the smaller the bond angle, the greater the ring strain. So the smallest ring you can possibly make is a three-sided ring. So cyclopropane is the smallest ring, and it is the most unstable. Definitely know that. It has the greatest ring strain because you're essentially forcing the carbons to be, um, the carbons and the, the substituents very close together. They don't like that. So as we increase the bond angle, so we increase the number of sizes, or so the, num the number of sides, we're going to decrease the ring strain. So cyclopropane has the most ring strain cyclobutane has a little bit less, cyclopentane a little bit less, and then we get to cyclohexane, okay? This has no ring strain. It is the most stable. And you see this one in nature a lot more than any of the other ones, because again, remember, if something's unstable, it requires a lot of energy to make it and keep it in that state. So, you're not going to see cyclopropane in nature very often because it takes so much energy to make it and uh, maintain it. So you see this a lot in nature. You're going to hear a lot about it. It's kind of the, the big important piece of this chapter. Once you go past cyclohexane, ring strain actually goes up. So even though the bond angle has gone down, other sorts of ring strain ha are, have come into effect. So I believe it's from 7 to 13, you have increased ring strain again. Once you get past 13, it goes back to having no ring strain. Essentially, it kind of looks like a, a, a straight chain alkane. It like can rearrange itself, so it, it really doesn't have any ring strain at all. Any questions on this piece? This is pretty important. This is kind of like the groundwork for the rest of the chapter. Okay. Um, the next section just quickly talks about trans and cis. Um, I don't want to spend a lot of time on this because I don't think he's going to really emphasize this too much. Um, but does everybody remember cis and trans from general chemistry? Okay. So um, cis is when you have substituents on the same side. So his example, he uses the, the wedges. Not super important that you know the wedges, but versus. So two wedges just mean that the, C, the car, uh, chlorines are on the same side. So cis, same side. Here we have a wedge and the dotted lines. So this is on one side, this is on the other. So trans, I remember trans, you have to travel to the other one. So cis, same, trans, travel, however you can remember it. Um, 
I don't think that he'll have you identify them in this way because to do this, you'd have to use the wedges and the, the, the dotted lines. He doesn't normally like to use those on exams or quizzes because it can be confusing. Um, but he may say a molecule has two substituents on the same side. Is this cis or trans or something else configuration? So you should be able to identify cis and trans from that definition. The other piece here, um, so talking about physical properties, which we didn't really talk about for haloalkanes, but um, when we're comparing cycloalkanes to straight chain alkanes, uh, you should know that cycloalkanes actually have slightly higher boiling points and melting points. <clears throat> You don't necessarily need to know why, um, but just a good thing to keep in mind in general. So we talked about ring size, so types of strain. Does anybody remember any of the other ones? Just don't all jump at once. Transannular, <coughs> and then substituent eclipsing strain. I wrote that wrong. In the past, he may give you one of these and ask for the other one. He doesn't always ask for all three. Um, he does try to throw you a bone there. So uh, at the very least, though, I mean, these have these memorized. You're definitely going to get asked about this. Other than that, I think <coughs> the most confusion from this chapter has to do with the little descriptions about each of these molecules and, like, what do you need to know from them. Um, I will say that there's a lot of information here that he doesn't necessarily quiz you on. He's not as concerned with that. Another thing to keep in mind is he's quizzing you on two chapters. He only has about 20 questions. So he's not going to ask you, you know, um, cyclopropane, you know, does it have more transannular or more substituent eclipsing strain? That's not a question he's going to ask you. It's going to be more general. So I know there are, there's a lot of information for each of these. Uh, but don't feel like you have to memorize them, okay? I'm going to spend most of my time on cyclohexane because, like I said, this is the, the big point. There is a lot more information about that one. Um, so don't get too caught up in the other information, I guess, is the best suggestion I can give you. So cyclohexane can make four different conformations. Does anyone remember any of them? What are you guys sitting in? Is that like the boat and the chair? There you go. Yeah. Yes. So chair, I heard boat. There's two more. Uh, twist boat and, and half chair. I almost wrote it so it would be perfect. Okay, so things to know about these. Definitely don't worry about the, the graphics and trying to identify boat versus twist boat. He's not going to put graphics like this on the, on the quizzes or exams. Again, not his concern. Um, you should know some general characteristics, as in chair is the most stable. So chair has the least strain, in a sense. Does anybody remember which is the least stable? It's actually half chair. So definitely know those two, um, but I'm actually going to put these, I apologize, I should have thought ahead. I'm going to put these in order so you can see. So this is actually in order of most stable to least stable, the way I have it written right here. Um, and one way to remember that, um, if you remember that chair and half chair are the two at the very ends, it actually goes one word, two word, one word, two word. So chair, twist boat, boat, half chair. So that may be helpful 
on, on a quiz. Um, he doesn't necessarily always ask for you to list them all four out like that. He definitely is more concerned with the most and the least stable, but doesn't hurt to know that. You do not need to get bogged down with the details of why twist boat is slightly more stable than boat. Okay, so don't don't get bogged down in those details. Feel comfortable with this and then move on. Um, let's see here. We're getting into some more difficult graphics. Um, so I want to talk about axial and um, equatorial hydrogens. Um, we are getting a little bit out of time here. So if you have your, your ring, and I'm not going to actually draw the, the full ring, but let's imagine this is a carbon on the ring. You can have hydrogens above and below the ring or on the same plane as the ring, okay? Things that are above or below, so the purple ones, are axial. Any idea on what, a good way to remember that? Perfect, that's a great one. Although, don't you have two axes? So that might get confusing. I, I like axial skeleton. Okay, so straight up and down. Um, whatever works best for you. If you can find a, a funny way to remember it, that's great. The ones that are on the same plane, those are equatorial. A pretty easy one for this is equator, right? Goes, um, cuts the, the globe in half. Um, so the ones that are in line with the ring are equatorial. Why do you need to know this? So um, specifically for cyclohexane, before I move on from that, um, you can have a situation where um, all of your axial hydrogens switch to equatorial and back vice versa. There is a term you should know for that. So it's called chair-chair interversions. It is bolded on Dr. Cosper's notes. Um, another word for it is conformational flipping. So again, when axial and equatorial switch places with each other. It's also important to know later on when you have um, groups other than hydrogens. So for example, get rid of this. So let's imagine we have a methyl group on, on this um, cyclohexane that I've only half drawn. Um, so here we have it in an axial position. And what you'll see on Dr. Cosper's notes, if we were to draw the rest of the ring, you have hydrogens here, even though this looks far away, you have hydrogens that are kind of getting, um, they're being pushed on. They're, they're, um, the methyl group is interacting with them. Um, so that itself causes strain. When the methyl group is in an equatorial position, there is no strain. It's out, it's away from the hydrogen, so this is a more stable <coughs> conformation. So anytime you have substituents, they're going to um, prefer, I guess if you want to think of it that way, the equatorial position. Um, and this is least stable. There is a name for these interactions. You probably heard it referred to in a different sense, um, but Gauche interactions, there's another long name for it, but if you remember Gauche, he'll be happy. So it's important to understand axial and equatorial in a couple different ways. Um, no, we're running out of time. I haven't got to... Well, I actually covered quite a bit. It's really just the last page that I haven't really touched on. Does anybody have any questions so far? I did that well. I doubt it. Um, 
I'm supposed to be having a biochemistry group. Nobody showed up last week. Um, so I can hang out for a little bit longer if you guys have want me to review something else. Are they coming down here too? They're supposed to be. I'm probably going to ch- run up and make sure that nobody okay. is straggling behind. But it's supposed to start at 4. But it just turned 4. So. Oh, what? Oh, maybe I should check in with them. Let me pause this so we're not recording nothingness.